Good, so maybe we start, but leave the door open in case more people come from another appointment previously. Uh, we're very happy today to have with us uh, Jesper Koll, who many of you know, or some of you have met already before because he has an affiliation to us. Let me very briefly introduce him. Uh, Jesper came to Japan in, well, in 1986, in the 80s of the last millennium. Uh, immediately became one of the top strategists and economists in Japan. Uh, until 2015, he worked as a chief strategist and the head of research for the uh, US investment banks of JP Morgan and uh, Merrill Lynch. And currently, he serves as the expert director for the Monex Group and the Japan Catalyst Fund and holds a position in several Japanese government and corporate advisory committees, including to Tokyo's governor's uh, Yuriko Koikas advisory board. Uh, in 2022, he was appointed as the global ambassador for Tokyo's Financial Center Initiative and he has many, many more uh, affiliations and accolades uh, to his name. Uh, in particular, he has his own sub-stack called the Japan uh, Optimist, which is highly readable. And uh, most important, we are lucky to have him as a member of the OIST boards uh, for a couple of years now and hopefully for a couple of years in the future. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for giving up this presentation on capitalism this works. that works, and we're super looking forward to what you have to tell us. Great, Thomas, thank you very much, hello. Nice to see you all. Um, I must say I'm a little bit embarrassed. Um, you know, you're all scientists. Um, I'm barely an economist. And um, you know, I think it was Roosevelt, the old American president, who said, ah, economists talking about economics. That's like peeing in your pants. Feels hot to you, leaves everybody else cold, right? But there we go. What I want to do is just give you a little bit of an overview um, and I want to start at the very, very big level, sort of uh, two or three forces that I think, um, you know, are shaping the world or that the world is trying to grapple with. And then we dive into some of the Japan specifics. And uh, hopefully you walk away with a little bit of a sense that yes, you know, Japan actually is um, capitalism that works and that there's plenty to be optimistic about. Like the first big force, right, you know, is look, I mean, you're familiar with this. When the telephone was invented to reach 50 million users actually took 50 years, right? The internet took seven years, right? Recently, last year, ChatGPT was 38 years. And it's good to know that the winner is a Japanese product, right? Um, still very fast. But the point being that, oh, the world is changing. Well, maybe the world is changing, maybe the world is not changing. But what is certainly changing is this information overload that we're all being bombarded with, right? And sort of sorting out information overload. What is important? What is not important? What is real? What is fake? Right? That's, I think, one of the big challenges that obviously the world is facing. Closer to home on economics. Anybody know what this is? This is what economists call the elephant chart. And what this is, it looks at global household sector incomes. So it's not GDP, which includes the government and corporations, but it's you and me, the people. And this looks all over the world, over the last 20 years, effectively, the mean growth was around 28%. Nice. And then what this thing does here, it looks at the distribution from the bottom 5% all the way up to the top 5% of income earners. And you get this elephant chart. Now, what is interesting, and the point, is this. If I take away the People's Republic of China, which, as you know, over the last 20 years was this enormous growth engine, right? If I take away households in the People's Republic of China and I see that growth was not 28, but it was only 11 percent, and more importantly, from the 50th percentile all the way up to the 95th percentile, incomes actually fell. So there was actually no growth for the middle class. And I think it's very clear from an economics perspective that the reason why you have Trump, why you've got social disgruntlement, 
is because basically outside of the People's Republic of China, the middle class is getting poorer. And when that happens, there's a feedback loop that obviously goes into politics. And whether that's Germany, whether that's France, whether that's the United States, whether that's the UK. And that's a big challenge that the world you know, is actually tackling with. And then, of course, the third issue is that, wow, <clears throat> now we've got this political consensus led by the United States of America that China somehow is the bad guy that you and I cannot do business with China anymore, right? But if you do that, my God, where is global growth going to be coming from? Because a lot of the global growth, not just for households, but also for the economy overall, actually did come from the People's Republic of China over the last 20 years. So you've got this question of information overload, increasing information dissemination, fake news, et cetera, et cetera. You've got a growth problem in the sense of that the advanced industrial economies, that the free world, so to speak, does not create economic growth for the middle class. And on top of that, you've got your primary growth driver over the last 20 years basically taken out of the system. These are very, very significant problems. And you know what I want to talk to you about is that given these overarching constraints, I think that Japan is actually a model economy. So hear me out. How many of you voted for Donald Trump? Sorry, stupid question, right? <laughs> Are there any Americans in the room? All right, OK, I'm sorry, but it's very easy to pick on America these days. <laughs> That's OK. I'm an honorary American. I was educated there. My wife's from America. It's a great place. Um, but look, Donald Trump said, oh, the judge of my presidency will be the stock market. As long as Wall Street goes up, everything is fine. I'm doing a good job. Well, it's nice and simple, but it's also stupid. Because anybody who is a leader, whether it's you in your research group, whether it's you know, your parents, whether it's me, my corporate boss, right? obviously, you do not optimize for one outcome. There are multiple outcomes that you're optimizing for. And in the sphere of economics, you know, you've got freedom. Freedom from government inter intervention and unfair competition. That's very important, right? You've got equity, a fair distribution of wealth. Efficiency, making the most of all the resources. Security, very, very important. I mean, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, what is it? Destroy and you know, run fast and destroy things. I mean, really, trust me, the older I get, the least I'm in favor of disruption. It's just human nature. You do want security. You do want predictability. And then, of course, yes, there is growth. And my point to you is that Japan is the model economy. It's not particularly good at optimizing for one of these variables. But it's very, very good at hitting the, the optimal point right, of maximizing all for all those variables. So you know. I work in finance. Finance is nasty. You guys are lucky. I deal with people who genuinely believe they are the master of the universe. right? Bill Ackman is a friend. Bill Ackman thinks he can control Harvard University, right? if you follow that recent controversy. Wow. For me, that's called a plutocracy. Right? So, but with these nasty people in finance, you know, you've got to do this elevator pitch. I've got, on average, when there's a hedge fund guy or whether there's a sovereign wealth fund guy, when I engage with them about Japan, I've got about 12 seconds to get their attention. Because they're investors. They can put their money anywhere in the world. Why should I put my money in Japan? And in my case, since I've been in Japan for such a long time, they ask, well, what's different? And so over the last nine months, this is the chart that I'm using. What is different? is the fact that when you look at the Japanese elite, and if you are from the Japanese elite, you know, Tokyo University, Kyoto University, still it's very prestigious to go to the elite ministries, to go to the Ministry of Finance, to go to METI. And when you look at the data and say, fine, of these young men and women who joined the elite bureaucracy in their early 20s, right? how many of them quit while they're in their 20s or 30s? 
And you can see this is basically a flat line. Nothing happened here, right? But over the last six, seven years, this is starting to go up. And this tells me, as an economist, my most important resource, which is people, it's not AI. It's not a computer. It's not a te technology. My most important resource that creates the bulk of the value is human capital. And humans in Japan, the elite, is actually starting to move. And then, now I've got the hedge fund's attention. Right? Good. I've succeeded. My elevator pitch worked. Then you go to the second layer and say, aha, where do these guys go? Do they go to Mitsubishi? Do they go to JP Morgan? No. Three quarters of them go to startups. And that tells you that this whole idea of, oh my god, the Japanese, they don't take risk. This is wrong. Something is changing. The elite is now taking risk. And that's something that is new in Japan and that tells you that there is room for optimism. Because when human capital begins to move, when they are no longer prepared to tough it out, right, at the elite bureaucracy. They are actually prepared to take risk, not going to an established company, but going to a startup. Now I've got something that I haven't had in Japan literally since the Meiji Restoration. So Japan is ambitious, is a bastion of stability, and is confident. Sorry, it's another thing that economists have to do. We have to come up with these slogans, right? Um, a little bit about me. So I was an unsuspecting PhD student at uh, Hopkins University. And one day, somebody walks in and says, hey, how about going to Japan? Um, we pay you 1000 bucks for three months, you know, and we put you in one of the great Japanese companies. And I said, where is Japan? And the guy said, 9,000 miles away. And I was living with a wonderful woman at the time, but it wasn't going so well, and I didn't have the heart to break it up. I thought, wow, 9,000 miles, that should do the job. <laughs> so I show up in Japan, right? And they pay me $1,000 at the end of every month, right? And so I was at Kyoto University, right? Fantastic. And at 260 yen to the dollar, I was the king of Kyoto. It was fantastic, right? And then, of course, we have the Plaza Accord, where the United States of America, thank you very much, right, forces a devaluation of the currency. And as a result of that, I end up being poor, right? So I had to start to get a job and do all sorts of things. So I ended up working first for a Japanese politician, um, Mr. Koizumi, who ended up becoming prime minister. I did that for three years. And then I worked for all these investment banks and uh, investment firms here. I joined finance, <laughs> the great house of S.G. Warburg, one of the prominent investment banks of its time. Right? I joined, and the government bond yield was 8% on that day. And then, of course, it's downhill ever since. And as you know, bonds even collapsed all the way down to negative. Real estate, right? when I show up in Japan, we had one of the biggest real estate bubbles in the world. And then that whole thing collapsed, and it's only now that we're sort of back you know, to where, where I came from. Story of the stock market's a little bit better, right? But meanwhile, in the real world, this is the American stock market. So I leave America. And I work in finance, right? This is American real estate, basically the same sort of story. So story of my life, I mean, you know, hey, at the end of the day, numbers matter. Don't trust my advice. <laughs> Something went very wrong, right? But, but you see this enormous accumulation of wealth in the United States of America, while Japan destroyed more capital in the collapse of the bubble economy than she destroyed during the Pacific War. Despite that, the unemployment rate never went above 5%. Never did me or my wife have to worry about our nine-year-old daughter taking the subway at 11.30 on a Friday anywhere in Tokyo. An unbelievably strong concept. And so let's have a look. Now, you know, who's rich? Very simple, right? It's economics. It's finance, right? What do people talk about? You're supposed to get rich. 
OK, so look at this. Household wealth is from the latest report there from UBS, right? You find the median household wealth net of liabilities is about the same as America. That, 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 despite this huge discrepancy in asset prices, you look at the distribution. Of course, there are poor people in Japan, no question, right? But you do see you know, that Japan has a pretty equitable distribution of wealth. And by the way, United States, you know, this was before COVID. You had all these support measures you know, for the poor people in America kick in because of COVID. That number over the next couple of years is going to go back up to around 20%. Right? So it's quite interesting you know, that you've got this sort of dispersion here. Winner takes all, the top 1%, very topical, right? Oh my God, everything is owned by Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, right? Well, again, Japan has rich people, very rich people, right? No question. But the top 1% only own, <coughs> excuse me, about 20%. Meanwhile, this. By the way, anybody here from China? No. But it's interesting, right? And as an economist, right, the communist system of China and the United States of America, that nasty capitalist system, basically deliver the same result. It's kind of interesting, right? Now, look at this. I'm often asked, but I had this big fight with Michael Porter. He's like a Harvard Business School productivity guru. He said, ah, oh, Jesper, Jesper, Jesper. Japan you know, hasn't invented anything since the Sony Walkman. Right? They're terrible. Right? Japan is no longer number one. Japan is number one. If you look at social problems, and there are people who do this for a living, they put these indices, mathematics literacy. As you know, a 12-year-old in Japan learns calculus. If Japan slips by one point in the OECD PISA ranking in mathematics, it's a national emergency, right? Infant mortality, imprisonment, obesity, drug addiction. If you aggregate all of this out, you see that Japan, thank you very much, is number one in the world. By the way, I showed this chart six years ago. I showed this chart to the Trump White House. And they go, yeah, go America. <laughs> Top right hand corner. <laughs> I mean, you know, like I said, unfortunately, it's very easy to bash on America right now, right? But of course, the key point, and Thomas and myself will very much agree on this, the key point of this data is not that America is on top, that Japan, that Amer that, sorry, that America is at the bottom and that Japan is on top. But the key point is that Germany is better than France. <laughs> this is really important, right? Social mobility, right? I mean, there's another one of these things that economies are supposed to do, right? What they call intergenerational earnings elasticity. What does that mean? It means, do you have to come from rich parents in order to be economically successful? That's what that thing tries to measure, right? And again, you see that Japan is in a fantastic position, right? And it's interesting, right? The US obviously is the US, but what's interesting and potentially worrying is that in the People's Republic of China, right, at least according to this data set, if you really do have to be the son or the daughter of a princeling to be economically successful, then that's not a sustainable social structure, right? So that's something that you've got there. Bringing up the bottom. I mean, look, you guys, sooner or later, you're going to start to run bigger teams. You're going to manage things, right? Motivating the top 10% is easy. I mean, they're there, you know, they do their stuff anyways, right? A really superb manager, a really superb leader is somebody who brings up the bottom 10%. And when you look at the data, this is from the OECD, you actually find that Japan is the one country where over the last decade, the bottom 10% have grown faster in terms of income than the average, which is very, very interesting. Why is that? Any guess? Why is that? It's because of my wife. My wife is Kathy Matsui. She coined the term womenomics, right? Empowering females in Japan. And you can statistically show that about 60% of this improvement for the bottom 10% is because of rising female participation and slowly but surely rising female empowerment. By the way, did you see the news last week? Japan Airlines, the new president, CEO, 
is a 59-year-old woman who started as a stewardess at Japan Airlines. And don't tell me this country isn't changing. Good inflation. I mean, you know, whoa, Japan has deflation. Terrible. Like, really? Japan of the consumer price index, right, the, guy, the basket that measures inflation, right, of the consumer price index, about one third of all the prices are regulated by the government. For example, Medicare. In the United States of America, your medical costs as a consumer basically double every six years. Now, does your income double every six years? Uh, not while you're at OIST. Oops, sorry. <laughs> sorry. We, I blame the exchange rate. <laughs> no, but look, I mean, it's interesting, right? In Japan, medical prices, basically for you and I, the consumer, fall every year by about 1%. Because the government is not afraid to take on vested interest. Right? Let me give you an example. Prime Minister Abe, in, um, uh, when was it, like about six years ago, he called into his residency, into the Kante, he called in the CEOs of the four big telecommunication companies. All right? And he had one chart. And that chart showed the price of a five giga mobile phone contract. And there was London, and there was Taipei, and there was Shanghai, and there was New York, and then there was Tokyo, 40% higher than the average. And Abe only said one sentence. He said, this is a national embarrassment. Fix it. And they did. Mobile phone prices, as you probably are aware of, you know, have actually been coming down. I don't want to be too romantic, but some of you are familiar with this idea of Mr. Piketty or Karl Marx, that the returns to capital over time are larger than the returns to labor. And so the question is, how do we redistribute from capital, from corporate profits, into labor, into the household sector? And the Japanese government is actually doing that. I, in my professional life, I never invest in a Japanese medical company or a telecommunications company or anything that is close to being a public good. Because the moment you make excessive profits, the government is going to force it down to raise the purchasing power of the people, which is very, very interesting. Final point. I mean, bureaucracy. You don't know what that is at OIST, right? <laughs> oh, but look. Japan is the only country in the OECD, right, where we've seen genuine administrative reform. In 1989, they changed from 22 major government bureaucracies into 13. There was some growing pains. There was some uncertainty as to how this is all going to work out. But this is the only country where the financial crisis actually led to structural reform in the institutional framework which is very interesting. In Europe, after the Euro crisis, nothing. In America, after the Lehman shock, there was a tightening of capital adequacy rules, but there was no institutional change. When I was at JP Morgan, I used to joke with Jamie Dimon, the big CEO, right? At JP Morgan in New York, at any given day, we had 52 regulators on average in our office. In Japan, you've got one financial regulator. Nasty, pedantic. Detail-oriented, but no regulatory arbitrage, while in America, you do. So it's interesting, right? So we've got this great socioeconomic system where I actually think you know, the elite, in terms of its ability to renew and its ability to actually reorganize itself and not be afraid to take on big industrial interests, right, actually works very well. So it's great. We've got a great socioeconomic construct, right? But we don't have growth. Right? I mean, look at this. Household disposable income, right? That's your money after you pay taxes, right? In America, whew, in Japan, basically flatline, right? So let's have a little look at the Japan reality, all right? <clears throat> you know, I've been in Japan for almost 40 years. You know why I like being here? 
the only place where everybody else gets older faster than I do. <laughs> now, that's obviously not true, right? But, I mean, you're living in a society where one in four is over the age of 70, right? My friends always say, yes, but you're crazy, you're nuts. How dare you be bullish on a country where in 311 years, only 11 people are going to be left? Right? Do, do, do I care what happens in 300 years? No. I'm an investor. I'm a business person, right? I'm interested in what happens over the next five to six years. That's a horizon that you can reasonably, you know, sort of predict and build scenarios around, right? So Japan has this big aging society. There's no question about it. And obviously, as a result of an aging society, there are things that are changing. For example, in a young society, you basically buy a new car every five or six years. It's a replacement cycle. It's the same with the refrigerator, all the white goods and brown goods, right? In an old society, you don't do it, right? You either buy no car and use public transport, or you buy a sports car, and that car you drive till you're dead, right? So it's quite interesting. Aging society. There was a decree in the country uh, nine years ago my friends who come from Hong Kong, who come from Taipei, who come from Shanghai, they land in Narita, they land in um, Haneda, right? And they complain, God, the public walkways, the electric walkways, they're so slow. In Hong Kong, everything's so fast, right? It's like, well, no, nine years ago, there was a public decree to cut the speed of all public walkways by 20%. And it's correct public policy, because if your average age is now one in four is over 70, these things become dangerous machines. Therefore, you should have a slower speed. Now, by the way, for you Americans, you guys don't have that problem, because your public walkways never work. Right? <laughs> anyway, you get the point, right? Final point on this, because it's a fun topic, right? Because you deal with this all the time. Oh my god, oh my god, Japan, Japan. Japan now sells more adult diapers than baby diapers. Terrible. It's like, no. You go and visit Unicharm, which is the leading diaper company, and you say, hey, how are things going? So oh, fantastic. Yeah, but what about those baby diapers? It's like, baby diapers. The profit margin on an adult diapers is three times as high as it is for a baby diaper. Because with a baby diaper, excuse me, you don't give a shit. With an adult diaper, trust me, I deserve the premium model. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, just, you know, look, it's a market. It's a reality. This thing is not India. This thing is not Vietnam. This thing is an old society, but it's very rich, which we'll talk about. There is a lot of purchasing power here, right? Yes, it's not a high gross. Yes, you do need to invest in adult diapers rather than in baby diapers, right? Or maybe dog diapers, which is one of the companies I'm investing in, right? Um, but it's interesting, right? You've got, you know, demographics there. Now, the key point I want you to take away is that far from being an obstacle, Japan's demography is actually a tremendous tailwind. Let me explain. You heard about this, right? That, oh my god, in Japan, 40% of all employees are now part-time employees or contract employees. They're not full-time employees. And this is very true. Now, 1995 was a year of utter crisis for this country. Anybody remember? Anybody born before? <laughs> Sorry. No, 1995, what happened? In January, we had the Kobe earthquake. The Kobe earthquake, Kobe at the time was the third largest container port in the world, taken out. Terrible destruction. Then, in March 1995, what did we have? Anybody? Doi Sensei. We had the Ohm gas sarin attack, where a Japanese group, a Japanese cult, right, poi or tried to poison the Japanese elite bureaucracy. They targeted Kasumigaseki, right, that train stop on the Hibiya line, right? It's quite interesting, right? So you had an internal attack against the elite. Earthquake, internal attack. And then in 1995, in the summer, we had a banking crisis. There were run on banks in this country. 
And so as a result of that, the Japanese government, the Japanese elite, actually did radical change. They, they organized, number one, the administrative reform that I talked about going from 22 to 13 major bureaucracies, right? More importantly, they implemented labor market reform where the entire labor market was deregulated so that every industry, you could now hire part-time employees or contract employees. It was the death of lifetime employment. It was the death of the salary man. And as a result of that, you see that the only growths in employment were part-time people, right? Now, anybody here works in admin, HR? You work in admin. Oh. <laughs> you very shyly raise your hand. Administrators are very important. No, but look, what's the difference between a full-time and a part-time employee in Japan? Anybody? What? <laughs> So you're right, there are these benefit things, right? But OK, remember hard nosed finance guy, right? Three big, three, big, three big differences. The first one, money, all right? The big difference is a part-time or contract employee does not get the corporate bonus. A Japanese company pays a corporate bonus, one in the summer and one in the winter. Right? It has a, you know, some correlation to profitability of the firm, right? but basically you get this thing. And on average, across industries, it makes up about 30% of your annual disposable income. So if I am a part-time employee and you're a full-time employee, your purchasing power, your disposable income is basically 30% higher. Right? Second difference. Anybody? Remember, we're talking about money. Oh, minna hazukashi, no. Japanese banks are nasty, even nastier than American banks, right? If you are a part-time or contract employee, love or money does not buy you credit. You can barely get a credit card, and you can certainly not get a mortgage. It's very, very important, right? So my income level is lower. Obviously, my job stability is much lower, right? And I have no access to leverage. So this is where the lost generation, as it were, or where this stagnation in disposable incomes actually came from, right? That you had this change in the labor market conditions that actually came through. Now what is happening is that we're at this inflection point. And it is precisely because the population is declining precisely because the number of high school and university graduates is dropping every year by about 20, 25,000 kids, that now there is a scarcity. There's a shortage of skill. There's a war for talent. And you see, even during the COVID years, right, you now see that full-time employment, which had been falling for, over 30 year, for almost 20 years, right, now full-time employment is actually growing. And you've got leading companies, you've got Toyota, you've got Hitachi, you've got the Mizuho Bank, rehiring part-time employees on a full-time basis. And this is great because my purchasing power goes up by 30%, plus I get access to leverage. So that has been my thesis. If you're really bored one day, I think 11 years ago I gave a TED talk the first line was, I want to be reborn as a 23-year-old Japanese, right? And they all thought, oh my god, this is a middle-aged crisis of some, <laughs> you know. No, you know, and it looked like, it looked idiotic, but it's just demand and supply, right? I mean, you know, when you are in a shortage relative to demand, the tables turn. And now the young generation actually does have price power. And you can see this, you know, in the number data. To verify my thesis, I have looked very, very carefully and continue to look very carefully at mortgage data. Because if I'm right, and there's a new cohort of Japanese who are in their 20s, who now get higher incomes, better contracts, access to credit, then fine, you should start to see an improvement in real estate prices. And that's exactly what's been happening. Not just in Tokyo, right? Not just in Okinawa, 
right? but increasingly even in the regions of the Japanese economy. So that's very, very important. And mark my words, I believe that Japan will be the only G7 economy where we will see the rise of a new middle class, exactly because young Japanese are in short supply. Another way of looking at this, if you look at you know, where we are today, this is the average apartment in Tokyo, which is about 70 square meters. You do see that you're now back up to where you were at the bubble peak. So the question is then, oh, is this a bubble? Well, on that absolute data, we're back at the bubble peak. But that's the wrong way of looking at it, in my opinion. You need to look at affordability, right? And if you do that, you actually find that if I now do take out a mortgage, right, on the average terms that the mortgages are offered, you actually do find that affordability is still very, very good, right? Which, by the way, for those of you who are interested in finance, is one reason for why the Bank of Japan will not be in a hurry to increase interest rates. Because you can show if I increase mortgage rates by one percentage point, uh, wages, incomes, would have to rise by 14% to keep affordability the same. That's a big constraint you know, that you actually have in the Japanese system. This just shows you that, you know, relatively speaking, Japan is certain. And so you see, this is the guy who pretends to be the prime minister. And this is the guy who pretends to be the governor of the Bank of Japan. He was actually my professor. Um, and anyway, they have this nice consensus, right, to let the bubble keep bubbling, you know, for the time being there. Now, you get the point on the consumer. Now, a little look at companies, right? And I'm sorry, this is speaking my own book here. I invest in companies. I don't invest in countries, right? And what has changed in companies? First of all, what I look at very carefully when I make an investment is I look at ownership. Who actually owns this thing, right? And you see that, you know, cross shareholdings. What is that? Mochi ai. Anybody? So this is the big Japanese groups. They used to be called the Zaibatsu during the Pacific War. And then there were the Keiretsu, right? So this is the Mitsubishi group. This is the Sumitomo group. This is the Mitsui group. And they're cross shareholdings, owning shares in each other. The steel company, the bank, the trading company, the electronics company, right? Used to own half of the Japanese equity. So this was an insider's club, right? Now, it's basically open. And by the way, the gaijin, sorry, the devil, sorry, the foreigners, sorry, global capital owns about a third of the thing. By the way, anybody here from Korea? I was going to ask, what other country has cross shareholdings? Korea, right? And they're actually still family structures. If you look at the Samsung group, if you look at the Hyundai groups, right? Germany had very high cross shareholdings. But Chancellor Schroeder gave tax incentives to unwind that, right? So it was quite interesting. But Japan, the point being for ownership, Japan has, was a closed system. If you were not part of the Mitsubishi group, if you were not part of the Mitsui group, you didn't have access to proper accounts, to corporate strategy, etc. Now you actually do. It's become an open system. And then the second thing here, you look, obviously, to make an investment. Who owns the company? And by the way, recently, I mean, if Warren Buffett buys Japanese trading companies, as an investor, you should at least study them, because he's no fool, right? And so if he becomes an owner, and by the way, he owns about 11% of the trading companies now, right? You know, this, this obviously makes a difference. Who owns the thing I'm buying, right? The second thing is performance, right? And you see, if you look at EPS, that's earnings per share, that's basically profits. We'll talk about it a little later. And then ROE, return on equity, is basically capital efficiency, right, from a shareholder's perspective. And you see that Japan had very low return on equity, and now it's about 8.5%. My American friends, how many of you guys actually invest in stocks? Okay, sensei. <laughs> What's the ROE of America? God, you just invest because your friend gives you a tip. Oh, one of these. Huh? 
<laughs> meme stocks. That's your thing. I see. No, no, but like, look, return on equity in America is about double, right? It's about 15, 16%, right? If you look at the distribution of the return on equity, right? So capital efficiency, right? Low to high, right? Japan is this incredibly boring bell curve, right? Centered around eight, eight and a half percent, right? America is terrible unless you get to Michael Jordan. I mean, America is superstars, right? The Magnificent Seven, the Gaffan, there's always, you can always come up with wonderful names for the whole thing, right? So it's quite interesting, right? So Japan, actually, if you take out, if you adjust for this, right, Japan is actually way better than the average American company, so to speak, right? But Japan doesn't have any superstars. Why does Japan not have superstars? What? Taxation. Taxation, you say, okay. Anybody else? It's wonderful, right? People come up with wonderful explanations. It's great, great dinner conversation. Oh, the Japanese are not greedy. They look out for them, you know, all this anthropology. Sorry. <clears throat> Hi. Anyway, I'm an economist. I should be careful. Um, this is the reason. If you look at the industrial structure, okay, of the top four firms in the different industries, from hairdresser to steel company to semiconductor company, you name it, in the United States of America, the top four firms control about one-third of all revenues. That's called an oligopoly for all intents and purposes, right? In Japan, in contrast, this thing is red ocean, hyper-competitive. In the average industry, the average guy, the average top four, barely control 12% of all the revenues. You've got hyper-competition. You and I setting up a company is nice, but you know what? Within three months, somebody will copy us and basically enter the market as well, which is very, very interesting, right? That you've got this element. And that's, of course, if I don't have, if I've got so much competition, I don't have price power, right? And that's a big difference, you know, that you actually have here. You can look at it the other way. You know, this is listed companies. Look, this is the size of GDP and the market capitalization. The equity market is about seven times bigger in the United States but the number of companies is basically about the same. So the pie that you're competing in, right, is much, much more difficult here. The point I'm trying to make is America has these superstar salary, uh, you know, CEOs, right? Look at Japan. This is the top line. This is your revenues. And revenues in Japan have been stagnant for one generation, for 30 years. Have you ever run a company? If revenues are flat, maybe for one or two quarters, you can raise profits, right? Because you cut costs. But over 30 years? I mean, these guys deserve the Nobel Prize for applied economics, right? Profits are up, right? Um, look at the data. If you compare it to the superstar CEO in America, Japan profits up 11 times, America three versus six. It's quite interesting. Whoops. Who gets the money? It's quite interesting, right? I mean, the Japanese are not greedy or the way this, the compensation system is set up, right? I mean, there's a reason for my Mr. Otani plays in the US rather than in Japan. But it's quite interesting, right? I mean, therefore good, therefore bad, again, be my guest, right? But I'm just trying to point out from a systemic perspective, never ever be fooled by a Japanese salaryman CEO. These guys are exceptional operational managers, right? Some specifics for those of you who are interested in economics, right, and investing. This is sales. This is since data started basically in 1990, when the Tokyo Olympics happened in 1964, right? Um, you see the top line growth, sales, you know, there was all this growth and then it basically flatlined. Employees, so how much do the workers get, right? You know, during the bubble, they got a little bit more and then they now get a little bit less. 
you know, be my guest, right? But the interesting thing is that people always say, oh, the Japanese don't pay their shareholders. Well, that's actually not true. If you look at dividends and share buybacks, they actually do get the lion's share, which is quite interesting, right? The problem is that in Japan is that retained earnings. So what is that? That's when you and I make money and we don't think we need to raise the dividend. We don't think we need to buy another company. We don't think we need to pay our employees. We don't think we make more capital investment. That goes on the balance sheet as sleeping cash. And this is where Japan excels, right? This is my favorite chart. This is retained earnings or cash on balance sheet. I've divided it into national income, into GDP, so you can compare it. And you see that everywhere in the world, Japan, France, China, UK, Korea, everywhere cash on balance sheet has gone up. Anybody, why? After the global financial com crisis, companies don't trust their bankers. During the global financial crisis, IBM was canceled an overnight trade credit from one of the major uh, American banks. Said, oh, this is too, too risky for us. Overnight, you're IBM. Anyway, so as a result, you've got this cash cushion. And anybody who runs a company, you need a cash cushion. It's just like your, your own household, right? You, you need a cash cushion. But do you need to have grown this from 30% of GDP to 130% of GDP? I once showed this chart to, God bless him, Prime Minister Abe, and he was frothing at the mouse. He goes, let's tax them. It's interesting, right? I mean, again, this is money that accumulates basically at zero interest rates. And this is the listed companies that are supposed to be the greedy guys who are supposed to maximize profits. So obviously, your textbook finance doesn't quite seem to work. Sorry, can I make an advertisement for the country that plays the worst football in the world right now? Germany? It was quite interesting, right? Germany is the only country where there isn't an increase in retained earnings. Why is that? Because Germany is the only country in the world that has a different model of corporate governance. When people talk about corporate governments, they talk about, oh, we need more outside directors. Oh, we need more foreigners. Oh, we need more women on the board. Maybe, maybe not. I do not know, right? In Germany, labor, by law, the labor unions are 50% of the board. So if you and I run a company, we make money, we don't think we need to buy another company. We don't think we need to make any investments. We don't think we need to <clears throat> raise the dividend. Hi. Therefore, it goes to us. And again, I'm not a socialist, but there's a reason for why Germany has one of the highest productivities in the world here. So it's interesting. Productivity. This is fun. I always joke, you know, when I was working for the politician, I learned a very good Japanese lesson, right? So you do fundraising, you hang, you're a politician, you, you have to hang out with all these people, right? And you know, when you don't like somebody or when you don't think somebody's particularly interesting, what do you do? You go to karaoke. It's fantastic because you can be together, you can have a good time, and you don't have to talk, which is great, right? Sorry, why do I say that? You often hear uh, economists or newspaper people talk about, oh, we need to raise productivity. Yeah, I know. I, I know I need to raise productivity. but. It's not interesting. How are you going to do that? What is interesting, when you look at Japanese productivity, you see the tradable goods sectors, the industrial, the manufacturing sector, basically you know, doing a good job. right? But you see the non-manufacturing sector, the service sector, basically flatlining. Why? One reason is the fact that labor was kept too low by this change in the labor market reform. right? The other reason is that Japanese companies never invested in new capital. Industrial companies run the most advanced robotic systems in the world. The service sector companies did not. This underinvestment, right, is a big issue. And I think, you know, for your innovation, you know, for your engagement with Japan, sort of contributing to the service sector, right, with some of your innovations, I think is going to be a big thing. How many remember this? Thomas, put you on the, you don't, come on, this was the Tokyo Olympics recently. 
This is Tokyo, this is the stadium, right? This was the closing ceremony, and what do they do for the first time on the global stage? We have a drone fireworks, right? And the drones do their firework thing, and then at the end, they turn into the globe, everybody holds hands and sings Kumbaya, and aren't we all a nice, happy, united human race, right? Hmm, so Japan is cool, very cool. 10 days later, this is Shanghai. In Shanghai, they do the same drone thing, right? And instead of singing Kumbaya, right, they end by putting up this QR code. If you take a picture of that with your mobile phone, you get a free video game. That's being commercial and cool. Japan is very cool, but it's not commercial. And that's, again, something where it gets very interesting. Finally, for the last five minutes, you hear a lot of economists and commentators talk about megatrends, right? What's a megatrend? Oh, AI is a megatrend. It's like, no, it's not. I mean, yes, it is. It's just the next evolution, you know, in software or in computer engineering, right? But it affects everybody. Whether you're a German company, whether you're a French company, whether you're an Indian company, whether you're a Japanese company, you have to deal with technological progress, right? Technological progress is very fungible, right? My engineers are better than yours. Really? For how long? Three months? I mean, come on, right? So what I want to ingrain upon you at the end, the four domestic megatrends that are happening. The first one is, yes, demographics as a catalyst for positive change. This thing, Japan, has 3.6 million companies. Of these, where the majority owner and CEO is over 70, it's now uh, 2.4 million. No successor, 1.3 million. So what does that mean? We now get industrial consolidation. We are now in the fourth year of a record boom in mergers and acquisitions, right? This is very, very exciting. Why is this happening? Is because the owner is now old and there's no successor, right? And that's when you start to sell. You and I have been competitors in our little bus business, right, in Fukuoka for all our life. You wouldn't think about merging with me because you hate me. Now, you all of a sudden love me because you hope that I'm gonna buy your company. But it's quite interesting, right? You've got this, you've got this thing you know, going on. It's empirical. So this red ocean that I talked about, right? The top four companies only controlling about 12% of the market share. This will now be solved by demographics leading to industrial consolidation. Second, Mick Jagger in Japan is unbelievably rich. This is the richest baby boom generation on earth. Right? Now what will happen is that, oh, it was Charlie Watts who had to go first. God, you guys don't even know the Rolling Stones. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, thank you. <laughs> no, but over the next 10 years, the baby boomers will start to die. And you can show that over the next decade, the equivalent of 1.3 times GDP is going to be unlocked because of death. Now, there's inheritance tax, so some of the money is going to, be ch going to be taken away, but this purchasing power of the younger generation because of death, right? Sorry, it's a terrible thing to say, right? Particularly for me, I'm older than you, but you're French. Ooh. <coughs> Sorry, we go back a long time. Um, anyway, you get the point. People will underestimate the purchasing power of Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe of the domestic market because there is money that is not earned but inherited. Right? This is a very, very big issue that is going on. The third driver is that, as you all know very well here at OIST, you know, we are now all too cheap. Right? We are very cheap. A friend of mine last year started a business. He found out that software engineers, right, in Tokyo are now one third of the price of a software engineer in Silicon Valley. And they are 30% cheaper than a software engineer <clears throat> in Hanoi. Are they 
better? Are they worse? Man, come on. You know, they're perfectly fine software engineers, right? You just got to tell them what to do. And he set up a company that provides the legal and mid-office services to provide contract to Japanese software engineers to engage with global companies. He does all the Mendoxai work, right? And he's now got 2,500 software engineers, right, happily working here in Japan because they're actually cheap. And then the final point, mark my words, this thing will become an immigration superpower. Right? I mean, this is just data. With immigration, people get very emotional very quickly, right? And quite frankly, there is no model in the world where the immigration model actually is successful, right? There's frictions everywhere. Look at the data. This is, you know, before COVID, there were basically about 170,000 people starting to work in Japan. Now, last year, and this is the first half annualized, so there's some pent up recovery, I get that, right? But basically, it's, about, it's annualizing at about 350,000. When I showed up in 1985, how many non Japanese living here? 500,000. Today, 3.2 million. And it's growing at 300,000. The visas are being deregulated, et cetera, et cetera. Last year, my favorite moment. What's your favorite convenience store? Ha! <laughs> yes! No, no, but, right? So Seven and I, last year, a friend of mine whispers into my ear, oh, did you know? No. Did you know that last year in April, Seven, 7-Eleven, sold its first franchise to a non-Japanese. A woman from Nepal who showed up 11 years ago as a Mombusho scholar, right? She started working and 10 years ago, if you were non-Japanese working in a convenience store, trust me, you got discriminated. There's no question about the whole thing. But now she owns the franchise. So I call my friend who is on the board and say, hey, I want to meet. I want to talk to these people, right? I said, yeah, yeah, okay, ta -da. So he introduced me to the guy. He said, oh, course on. Yeah, yeah. We've got this project. This project is called Gateway Japan. Okay, talk to me. We had employed some mathematicians and sort of said, look, today we've got 13% of our workforce is non-Japanese. And our primary cohort is Japanese students, right? Now, Given the demographics, we want to stay the number one convenience store company in Japan, right? By 2030, how many foreigners do we need? Even with more robotics at the checkout center, et cetera, et cetera, the answer is 50%. So the board just said, okay, let's start Project Gateway to Japan. We are now openly, not just encouraging foreigners to work at a 7-Eleven, but we're going to give you free education on Japanese accounting, on Japanese taxation, on Japanese you know, business rules. And after four years, if you want to buy the franchise, we will give you a loan. It's like totally pragmatic. Right? So this is you know, definitely happening here in Japan. And I think people completely underestimate you know, how strong uh, you know, immigration in Japan is. The big change. And the big, big obstacle is that your large corporate sector still basically remunerates people on the basis of seniority. Right? Do we have time for an anecdote? So I was at JP Morgan. I was the head of research, right? So there's like, you know, whatever. we were a thousand people at the company, right? We had this management meeting, and the guy, the boss, you know, some American guy, so sort of said, oh, we've got a problem in tax accounting, right? Okay, got a problem in tax accounting. Yes, we do have a problem in tax accounting. So then the next week before the next management meeting, he goes around to all of the heads, the head of equity, the head of fixed income, you know, and said, hey, when you've got a problem with tax accounting, what do you do? Oh, Ishi-san. Ishi-san gets it done. Okay, goes to the equities guy. What do you do? Oh, Ishi-san. I don't even have to ask. He delivers, right? Okay, next management meeting, right? All of us sitting around there, the guy says, you know, hey, you know, I've spoken to all of you, as you know, and you all tell me Ishi-san. So let's promote Ishi-san to become the head of tax accounting. All of these guys go, can't do that. Because there's Watanabe, who is three years his senior. So I raised my hand and said, let's fire both of them. 
No, but, but I mean, sorry, you get the point. Seniority matters, which is one of the nice things about Japan, particularly the older I get, right? But, you know, but the reality is, why is there lack of labor mobility? Why is there a problem for women to move you know, back into corporations right, after giving birth? Yes, it's childcare, this, that, or the other, but the big obstacle is the fact that you are basically compensated on the basis of seniority. If you're an engineer at Hitachi, right, the only reason you leave to go to Fujitsu is because the guy who is your boss doesn't like you anymore. It's not because you're actually better than the boss. And if you move to Fujitsu, Fujitsu will say, hey, this guy, KO Engineering, eight years on the job, here's his pay slot. It's quite interesting. So there's actually no positive incentive for anybody to move. And the exciting thing is that you've now got a dinosaur, Japan's most unionized company, which is NTT. NTT, since April last year, has a new president. This president, since last year, implemented pay for performance. And you can actually now at NTT, I mean, we'll see how it plays out, but you will actually see younger people being the boss of older people. And again, this is where it gets interesting, this next generation elite on the move. This is a generation that is ambitious. This is a generation that recognizes it is in power. The tables have turned, right? And as a result of that, you, know, you will find extra productivity growth. Final three minutes, I promise, Mr. Kishida. Challenges. One is a big global one. This is Japan, right? If I look at listed companies, basically now 62% of the profits come from the rest of the world. Toyota hasn't made money selling a car in Japan for 13 years, right? Because there's so much competition, right? There's not a lot of demand either, right? When you look at the regional distribution, it used to be all about America, right? This obviously over the last 20 years has changed with China and Asia having become more important, right? Why is this a policy challenge? It's because America now plays hardball. There's a new Cold War. Anyway, you get the point. For a Japanese corporation, having to pick between America or China, it's just not an option because I need both. There's no question that I need both. So that's a policy challenge. The big economic policy challenge is the fact that, yes, do you have zombies in Okinawa? You've got lots of zombies in Okinawa. What is this? 12% of Japanese companies cannot pay their interest expense out of current profits. And that's with interest rates being basically zero zombie companies, right? Why is the market so cluttered? It's because in Japan, bankruptcy was not allowed. This is one of my favorite charts. 1960s, right? High growth period. When Japan was the superstar of the world, eight, nine, 10% growth, you had bankruptcies rising. Then you had the bubble, right? Incredibly good times, so bankruptcies fall. Shortly afterwards in the 1990s, the bubble collapsed, bankruptcies rose again, right? But then, basically in the year 2000, your friends from the LDP, the ruling party, issued a moratorium. There will be no more bankruptcies. And as a result of that, all these government support programs were put into place. About 70% of all corporate loans outstanding are guaranteed by you and me, the Japanese taxpayer. It's quite interesting. So the interesting thing in terms of a policy challenge, remember, I've got excessive competition. I've got all this red ocean. Yes, there is mergers and acquisitions, right? But also, I need the bad guys to actually go out of business. Because when they go out of business, that frees up land. That frees up some people. It's painful. I get that, right? But that's how you get economic growth. Right? And that's going to be a big policy challenge going forward. Finally, as an economist, I'm always asked, where does growth come from? You know, and it's not population, right? but it is entrepreneurship. And you can show, if you look at the share of entrepreneurs in your population cohorts, right? the higher 
the number of entrepreneurs, the greater your potential growth rate, right? The purple thing was Israel, right? I mean, there's obviously a disaster now, right? America, very, very entrepreneurial, right? Absolutely no question about it. Japan, you can learn a great Japanese word, is chuto hampa, right? Japan is neither here nor there, right? And of course, Germany is better than France, but you know, that's uh... <laughs> Anyway, final point. My mentor, when I turned the Japan optimist in, 19, in 1999, 2000, my mentor says, yes, you're right. And this Japan was in depression, right? I said, yes, you're right. You know, you should be optimistic. This is good, right? But Kursan, you need to reconsider if and when Japan increases defense spending. Right? This is the most important consumer product over the last 30 years, right? Mobile phone, right? Of the entire value chain, how much is Apple? 3%. 97% is the American military innovation complex. I don't need to tell you this. The internet wasn't a bunch of nice guys at Stanford trying to talk to their friends at Berkeley. You know, it was DARPA and the American military scaling this thing up. Inventing something is easy for you and me. Scaling something up, that's what America does for a living. Why is this a potential worry? Because as you know, for reasons out of our control, it has been decided that defense spending in Japan will be doubled from 1% of GDP to 2% of GDP. From an economist perspective, if all of that money is being used to put air conditioning in the barracks, right? do you know that as a Japanese self-defense force recruit and as a Japanese self-defense force officer, you have to bring your own toilet paper? I kid you not, right? So if the money is used on this sort of stuff, plus you're buying Patriot missiles from, thank you, America, that doesn't do anything to make Hitachi or Fujitsu a better company. So dealing with dual use technology, dual use investment, right, is a complicated, complicated set of governance around this, right? And whether Japan can actually get this right is sort of a big question mark. So the one thing, I'm extremely optimistic, I think, you know, for my world as an investor, there's a lot of money to be made as this industrial organization, uh, reorganization happens, as the merger boom continues, right? Um, you know, as the younger generation of leaders takes control, but there is a potential worry, right? That indeed, if you have to start to invest in guns rather than butter, to use this old adage, right? That's the potential issue there. Now, of course, you know, in policy as well as in morality, the great secret is not to constrain the action, but to awaken the inclinations of mankind. This is my favorite economist who is a Frenchman. So there you go. Not only do you play very good football, but you also have very good economists. Anyway, if you thought this was marginally interesting, don't be shy. Um, this is my little substack here. And arigato gozaimasu. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. It was very, very interesting. Uh, you mentioned two major points that will lead to my question. The first one being, uh, you mentioned that there is this decrease of labor force in Japan, yep. leading to a more of an employee's market rather than an employer's market. But you also mentioned that there is this mass immigration yep. at the same time, which I think could lead to more employer's market rather than employee's market. So my very selfish question for my personal interest is what do you think is going to happen in the next few years? Is, are we going to be in an employer's market or an employee's market? So the answer is you will be in an employer's market, right? Um, sorry, in an employee's market, right? You have the power, right? I'm the loser, right? <clears throat> and, uh, you know, again, the reason is very straightforward, right? If you talk to Elon Musk, his problem is not technology. His problem is the team. How do I motivate the team, 
right? How do I incentivize the team? How do I create loyalty in the team, right? How do I create, you know, the proper incentives for them to stay and be more productive? And how do I put a system of governments where I can actually get rid of the underperformers in a fair way, you would hope, right? And this is exactly where Japan is now changing right now. As I come back to this point, the single biggest obstacle, right, is the reality of pay for performance absolutely necessary. I will give you an example. Five years ago, a friend of mine called me and said, hey, Jesper, remember Hiroshi? Hiroshi is my son, right? Oh, yeah, I remember Hiroshi. How is he doing? Oh, he's at MIT. And he's just about to finish engineering at MIT. And he got a job offer from Apple, from Siemens, and from Canon. Now, you've met Hiroshi a couple of times. What's your advice? I said, Ito-san, what do you want me to tell him? If he joins Apple and he's good and lucky, in 15 years, he can run the company. This is why we love America. If you're good and lucky, you can go really far, very fast, right? If he joins Siemens, a European company, if he's good and lucky in 15 years, he can be in charge of a region, Latin America, Asia, Europe, right? If he joins Canon and he's good and lucky in 15 years, what's it going to be? Cacho? I mean, the A team doesn't want to play for Japan. The Japanese own A team doesn't want to play for Japan because I don't know whether you like baseball. I mean, I'm German. I think it's a game of chance. But, um, you know, the guy is very good. Otani is very good. And they keep on all the guys who are very good at Koshien, the high school baseball team. They all go to the United States. They don't want to play in the Japanese league. So this change in the evaluation system, right? It doesn't mean that you have to become an arrogant SOB, right? But if you've got proper governance about incentivizing and also monetarily compensating. I did some research last year with the Kate Unren, with the big business organization, right? When I discovered this thing about the elite bureaucrats, right? And I found that if you were Japanese and you joined a Japanese top 50 company in the 1960s, it took you 12, 13 years to become bucho, to become general manager. Today, if you join a top Japanese company, it takes you on average 24 years to become general managers. The younger generation, sure you guys want money, that's fine, right? But more important than money is the motivation. You want to do something that is meaningful. I don't want to do copying or photocopying, right, at the Ministry of Finance while I'm 27, which is what these guys do. Anyway, so that's where it gets interesting. And I think, you know, just, I'm a firm believer. I think policy is overrated. Policy really doesn't matter. It matters for me in my day job when I make investments, right? But, you know, structurally for an economy, what matters is, number one, your resource endowment, right? And number two, when are there scarcities? When there's abundance, everything is easy. It's very easy. When the oil price is high, it's very easy for the Middle East to be on top of the world. When the oil price is at 20 bucks, now it gets interesting because there's a scarcity. And this is what's happening in Japan, right? Japan is very focused on human capital. Human capital is dying out. One in four is over 70. What are these guys going to do? I mean, sorry. You know, I mean, we're losing hair. That's what we do. Thank God we've got money. We can come and travel to Okinawa. We can come and travel to Okinawa with our grandchildren. Great. But I'm not going to invent the next breakthrough technology for Sony Corporation. That's where you come in. And you can make that pitch. So I think you guys are in a phenomenal position, right? Because you will actually be able to understand parts of the good parts of Japan and the parts that are not so good. Like I said, 
we do a great drone thing. The Japanese are unbelievably creative. Can they sell? It's hilarious. It's absolutely hilarious. And that's where you have an enormous opportunity because of your scientific skill, because you're global, and you know, because of your generally global perspective. Very, very important. So stay here and become the head of Sony. <laughs> what, sorry, what are you studying? Don't tell me you're studying chemistry. <laughs> the what? Neuroscience. What? Neuroscience. Neuros at Sony. <laughs> there you go. Sony. Yes. Any other questions? Sorry. Huh? Ha. Huh. If you were 23 in Japan, what would, what's the first thing you'd do? If I, I am 23. <laughs> hey. <laughs> it's very, I mean, it, it, it's very interesting. I mean, and, and I'm, I actually would want to set up a startup. Right, um, and I think that you know the the arbitrage opportunity, right, in terms of promoting disruptive technology into Japan, actually works very very well, right. Um, if that's an answer, right. Would you do that in Tokyo, or would you do that in Okinawa? Would you do something in Okinawa? Are you going to forgive me? <laughs> so I will tell you. Sorry, this is. Okay, I'm. Go for it. <laughs> No, I mean, I look, I tell you my personal story, right? So I show up in, in the first three months we're at Mitsui Busan, right, at the Japanese trading company. And I was supposed to go back, right? And I was pretending to do this PhD comparing something, something financial policy in Germany, something, something financial policy in the United States, right? And, you know, Japan looked interesting. I was 24. I liked the people I was with, right? And so I approached the guy I was doing the PhD for, or pretending to do the PhD for, um, you know, and he sort of said, hey, you know, Japan could be interesting. He said, and he knew something about Japan. And he said, yes, but great. You're 24. You can still learn the language. But for the first year, sorry, it was an old American guy, get the hell out of Tokyo because you will spend the rest of your life in Tokyo, right? And, you know, again, whether you're in design, whether you're in finance, whether you're in politics, whether you're in movies, I mean, the cluster of Tokyo right? It's just so enormous, right? That it's very, very difficult to escape that. There's obvious clusters, you know, around Osaka, Kyoto, very, very innovative, right? You know, obviously Fukuoka, but you very quickly run out of space, right? In terms of your market share. And this is what's interesting, because in my family office, right? We get a lot of pitches from people, you know, pitching, you know, why don't you become an angel investor in our company, et cetera, et cetera. And it's hilarious because, you know, Americans are just, which is why we love them, right? Americans immediately want to conquer the world. Here's my innovation. I'm going to become the next global standard, right? This is their pitch. And they got this scale that is just there. The Japanese guys, the way they pitch, oh, I want to be the king of Shibuya. You know, which is like a little district in, in, in Tokyo. It's like, you know, again, in terms of boys be ambitious, right? It's quite interesting because at the end of the day as an investor, and remember, money is fungible, right? I can go anywhere in the world. Now, of course, if your terminal growth rate, you don't need to be a finance genius for that. If your terminal growth rate is, pick a number, 2% versus the terminal growth rate, right, for somebody who goes global, Right? or focuses on Asia Pacific, where the terminal growth rate is 6, 7, 8%. I mean, as an investor, what do you want me to do? I mean, I can support this guy, but it becomes kind of like a social project. Sorry. You get the point, right? Hi, please. Uh, the, um, could you comment on the uh, regulatory frameworks in Japan? This uh, the bureaucracy that sometimes stifles innovation or stifles and how to get totally finance disagree. for startups totally in Japan. Totally disagree. If you're an entrepreneur and you feel stifled by the bureaucracy, you're not, a, you're not an entrepreneur. I'm sorry, your, your job as an entrepreneur is to be disruptive. No is not an answer, right? I'm fully aware that if I apply for grants and all of this wonderful stuff, that obviously I'm beholden to the bureaucracy, right? My advice to anybody is never, ever take money from the government. 
No, but I'm sorry, I'm not being facetious. This idea that rules and regulations are a big obstacle. That's all we do. No. <laughs> you must be working at OIST. No, no, no but, like, but, but look, in, in, in all seriousness, I mean, let me give you just a couple of examples, right? When you look at, <clears throat> when you look at wealth, right? These people who, like, who are the billionaires in Japan, right? Japan is the country where the fluidity of the top 10 people is the highest in the G7. In other words, you've got constantly new entrants. In America, it's always the same five guys, right? Just to give an example. Women, the first ever and still the only self-made female billionaire is a Japanese woman, Nambasan from DNA, right? Oh, there's obstacles. Yeah, there's obstacles. Sure, there's obstacles. It's called life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Of course, you know, I understand. And I'm on a couple of government advisory committees. You can make things easier. It's like the debate about the hanko. Sorry, I'm digressing, but you love this idea. Is the hanko a bad idea? The hanko is brilliant. The hanko is docu-sign, you know, 100 years ago. When my wife's away and we need to get something done, I can take her hanko and do this. I mean, this is awesome. Try doing this in America. Impossible. Right? What is the problem with the Japanese hanko? The problem with the Japanese hanko is not the hanko. The problem with the Japanese hanko is that when you get the document and you put the hanko on and it touches the line, they return the paper. That's called process. That's not hanko. So do you understand what I'm saying? There is, a, there is an enormous, and this I very much agree with you, the Japanese are pedantic. I mean, have you, any of you come back to Japan lately? Have you done the electronic Zeikan? I mean, how can you make this so complicated? How, how is this so complicated? You know, like seriously, Singapore, again, using technology, right, to actually smooth process, right? One of the companies I invested in was called Paydi, right? And you know, their CEO had a wonderful thing and his wonderful number one slogan was, no mendoksai. Japan is the king of mendoksai. But that's not the bureaucracy, you know. Sorry, let me, for 30 seconds, because there's a lot of misconceptions. Oh, the tax system. Really? What about the tax system? I pay, I'm sorry, I pay the same amount of tax that I would in, if I were living in New York City. I pay less tax than if I were living in Los Angeles. Now, it's small percentage points, but I mean, the tax system is a problem. Where's the tax system a problem? It's not a problem. A tax system is something that you get a tax accountant for. It's doable, perfectly doable. Do you understand what I'm saying? Right? You know. Now, again, it's a deviously difficult market. Right? Kishida, sorry, I'm bragging now. <clears throat> when they did this whole, now they finally embraced startup nation Japan and all that stuff in Japan, right? And so two years ago, you know, they called me and said, oh, you know, you've written on, on Startup Nation Japan, and so what, what can we do to make Japan you know, a startup nation? So my first word was, since I'm an arrogant German, right, I said, get out of the way. Right? Okay, that's not very polite, right? But the second thing is, think about this. Where, where are you from? Mexico. Oh, wow. Mexico is crazy. These are the longest business luncheons in the world. I always hate going to Mexico because, no, seriously, the lunch starts at 1 and ends at 7.55. <laughs> and then you say, well, what are you doing? Are you trading because of New York hours or something like that? No, 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 no. My wife needs to have me home at quarter past eight. It's like, wow, <laughs> this is a meritocracy if I ever saw one. Spectacular. But the point I was going, <clears throat> you know, the point I was going to make, right, is, uh, what was the point I was going to make? <laughs> No, but look, um, you know, again, kombucha. Anybody know kombucha? Okay, when I was growing up, and I'm sorry, I'm showing my age, there was no kombucha. Where did kombucha come from? So I haven't researched this, but I'm going to make it up. It sounds like a good story, right? You've got a bunch of hippies, right? And they run out of money. And then, you know, there's like a, you know, some, some Korean origin girl, right, with a guy. And they figure it out and say, oh, let's do kombucha. Right, and the kombucha, and the guy is like, oh, this is cool, you know, and said, fine. And so they figure out a way, okay, I can do 8,000 bottles. In America, what do you do? You get in a Greyhound bus, you go to the Whole Foods, 
and you say, hey, look at this. We've done this, kombucha. It's really cool. It'll be the next big thing. And by the way, we can do 8,000 bottles a month. And the manager will look at you, and maybe he'll like you. And maybe one of the other drink supplier is sort of falling a little bit behind. So he wants to hold that guy's feet a little bit to the fire. So he will look you in the eye and say, hey, I give you a shot. You get on the shelf, not eight, 10,000 bottles for three months. And I will look at every bottle of that. Get out of here and get start going. He will give me a shot. In Japan, if I invent something and I go to, sorry, Santori, right? And say, hey, I've got kombucha. I can do 8,000 bottles. They will taste it. Hmm, we see this name. And they will do all sorts of stuff, right? And then they will say, thank you very much, right? And then I will walk out and they will pick up the phone to the research department and say, hey, have you heard about kombucha? How about it? Sorry, I'm being a little bit facetious, right? But the problem that you have, you know, in Japan for commercializing a business, for getting scale in the business, the distribution system here is feverishly oligopolized, right? And getting on the shelf is very difficult. So the successful startup businesses in Japan are dominated, if they are B2C, right, are dominated by actually having internet-based distribution. Because that way, obviously, now I've got a platform where I can reach the customer directly. I don't need the distributor, right, to cut into the whole thing. <laughs> Japan has 470,000 wholesalers. Of those 470,000, three quarters do not have a customer who is a consumer. In other words, three quarters of all wholesalers buy and sell from another wholesaler. Breaking into that system, that's your real challenge. It's not the bureaucracy. It's never the government. And the finance, how would you finance a startup here? Make a pitch, right? We're open. We're open for business. Um, so you talked about like, the, different, uh, the benefits of different employment structures, yeah. and you said that the um, great thing for the younger people is that there's a switch from going from part-time employment to full-time and the benefits in the emerging middle class. Um, and you also talked about how the lifetime employment, you get all these like dinosaurs, and that's <laughs> kind of not that great. I wonder if you could comment a little bit on OIS structure, because <laughs> we have all of the admin and all of the students um, who are all part-time employees, employees and all of the professors who are all tenure track. And I wonder how that, if, if OIST, I know OIST is a science thing and there's, a, there's a, a reasons we have this system, but from your economics perspective. No, no. And, and you make a very, very important point, right? And you know, we should be having this discussion with the entire board here. I think that OIST is at a very, very interesting point, um, you know, in the sense of that fine. You know, for the last 10, 12 years, right, you know, you were starting from nothing and you build all sorts of things up, right? And you run fast, right? You know, you don't have to pay so much attention, right, towards efficiencies, towards fairness, et cetera, et cetera, because, you know, the pie was growing very, very fast, right? The interesting thing now is, and again, I'm just an economist, right? Now, you know, the pie is not going to grow. It's just a reality. So when the pie doesn't grow, right, actually beginning to focus right on how do i optimize what do i want to optimize for right what are the resources that i need for that optimization and how do i incentivize those resources because the old incentive system which was basically a candy store right cannot work anymore so some hard decisions no doubt will have to be made and you're you're very right to ask that question Right? I don't have an answer because, again, that is an answer that effectively, you know, every piece and parcel of the organization, whether it's human resources, whether it is social services, whether it is, you know, the academic side, et cetera, et cetera. But what you must not do and what the board will fight for very, very strongly is that the number one focus has got to be the science because it is OIST mission. It is the order of the Japanese government, which will always remain the primary sponsor of this project. The order is to be different 
to be a catalyst for change for the Japanese universities, right? So the fact that you now have institutions, that you've got rent-seeking behavior, that you've got unfairness in the system just because of the legacy that has been built up, right? Yes, I realize what the Japanese government did going from 22 bureaucracies to 13 by maintaining the level of services is something that needs to be considered very, very hard. Sorry, am I speaking out of line? Good. I'm running for president. Please. I uh, just had a quick question. Uh, as someone who's an American who has assets both in America and here, <laughs> my main, <laughs> you probably know what I'm going to ask. What is the point or what is, what is behind the sudden like devaluation of oh. the yen? Okay, so it's very, very interesting. And this is something you, you, you will appreciate as scientists, I hope, right? Is, you know, there is zero mystery in why the yen is weakening and the dollar is strengthening, right? It's the simplest economic model, which is just interest rate differentials, right? And as you know, Japan is married to and committed to effectively holding interest rates at zero. Right? And the United States of America went from zero to over 5%. So as a money guy, right, this is free money. It's called a carry trade. I can borrow at zero, effectively, right? And I invest in 5%. And all I need to make sure is that if and when the currency starts to have this volatility, to manage that volatility. But I make 5% just clipping coupons. No, but, but it's not currency. Of course, of course, it is currency trading in the sense of, yes, yes, it's blood, right? But why is the blood circulating at a faster speed, right? It's because of the interest rate differential. That's the key driver. And trust me, I once lost, <laughs> sorry, this is stupid, but and I once lost $2.5 billion in six hours. We were massively long, the dollar. This was in 1998. Right? And all of a sudden, God bless him, Bob Rubin, the Treasury Secretary, stands in front of a CNN camera and says, the strong dollar is no longer in the interest of America. That thing went from 147 to 111 in six hours. Trust me, if you're long options, it's hilarious. I mean, it's not, it wasn't funny. Right? You know, but so, you know, you've got volatility, right, in the whole thing. Yeah? When you remember, so, one potential worry, and sorry, what, the point I was trying to make, when you try to get the currency right, all you need to listen to is Jerome Powell, is the Federal Reserve. Japan doesn't matter. We're, right? slowly, we're slowly running out of time, but there's a lot of questions. So maybe we can do so, a couple of sorry, short, question, short answer type things. Short answer, I can't do that, I'm German. Where's the next microphone at the moment? So, there's a question there. So the, you raise the growth as the fifth goal of the economy, but these days the sustainability is a very large concern. So what's your view about uh, this uh, growth and the sustainability and how Japan is positioned uh, in the uh, need for the uh, sustainable uh, economy? It's very interesting. So I, the, the short answer is that Japan is doing all the right moves, right? But the speed timetable is just very, very much behind. You know, for example, Japan is committed to introduce carbon pricing, right? By, what is it, 2038, right? And by that time, we'll all be dead. <laughs> you know, sorry, you know, Europe introduced it, right? And you know, you can, you know, however, MIT has this wonderful model on climate change and actually introducing carbon pricing, right? Is, you know, in terms of the immediate impact that you have, it's actually very, very powerful, right? So the irony is that is an area where the government, you know, is making all the right moves, but it is making the right moves, right? At, it's making the right moves without a true sense of urgency, right? In hindsight, what would you have done differently? As a human being? Sure. <laughs> What I would have, no, I'm, look, I mean, it's, oh God, that's, a, you're going to buy me a drink. Um, 
You know what? You, you're going to hate me for saying this, right? But you know, I now think actually having studied law would have been a good thing, right? Because you really, sorry, and this is terrible. I loathe lawyers, right? But you realize at the policy level, as well as at the corporate level, right? Actually having a more solid understanding on how the legal science, how the legal framework actually works, is incredibly important, right? And you can do it learning by doing, but I wish at an earlier stage in my life, right, I would have spent six months, right, to do some, what do you guys do, remote learning programs, right, on dealing with lawyers, because dating female lawyers just wasn't good enough. <laughs> Any other questions? OK, we have until a quarter to last question then. Last question. A more practical question this time. It is uh, if I, uh, because it's apparently very uh, yeah. encouraging uh, from your first uh, answer, staying in Japan after a PhD here, if I want to invest in the stock market here, what yeah. are the resources I need to uh, look for or look, look towards? Look, 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 stock investing, right? The nice thing is that the enemy of a retail investor is number one, fees, and number two, fear. Right? Because you're a human being. If you read in the newspaper, oh my God, it's down 10%. You're not going to buy. It takes me 30 years of experience to actually have the balls, excuse me, to actually buy when it's down 10%. Right? But you know, the fee thing is very, very important. Sorry, can I be a little bit longer? Think of things, think of me. Right? So I need to make a living. Right? I make a living by attracting your money. And I need to make a living, and so I will charge a fee. So how high is that fee? So the fund that you should buy should be the lowest fee offering that is available, right? In the old days, right, it used to be that you had to pay 2% for the privilege of investing in my Fidelity Fund or BlackRock Fund, et cetera, et cetera. Today, because of democratization, because of technological progress, because of deregulation, you can buy an ETF. An ETF costs you about 30 basis points, 0.3%. Buy the ETF as a retail investor. Don't buy the 2%. I can tell you a great story. I've got a great, I've got a great fund. You know what we charge? We charge 2 in 20. So if the money goes up, of the profit that goes up, I get 20% which is great, but don't invest in my fund. I mean, not you, you understand what I'm saying? It's like, you know, so you want to be just open an, uh, an interactive, you know, self-directed brokerage account. The governance around these is perfectly fine. Remember, this is the one country where nobody lost money when FTX went bankrupt. Even on crypto, Japan has proper rules and regulation, right? So it's quite interesting. So low fees, ETFs, and then you can, I mean, you know, high dividend, right? You know, the Japanese dividend yield is about 2.5%, right? If you buy a high dividend fund, like Warren Buffett buys the trading companies, they still have a dividend yield of 4%. If my cost is 0.3 and my dividend income is 4, there's some slippage and you've got to pay some taxes, et cetera, et cetera, but you're still good. You're making money before the thing actually goes up, right? So that's the cushion that you actually want to do. Just be simple. Don't be clever. Because trust me, finance has a lot of clever people, but all we really want is your money. <laughs> Capitalism that works. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, 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 that was, that was, no, no, this was, this was American capitalism. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much again, Jesper, for this insightful talk and your time for all these questions.